Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the BSF Take Stock Best Management Solutions for Corn webinar. We're glad to have you join us here this morning. My name is Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com and also host of Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. You can also uh, get the radio show through a uh, podcast as well. Uh, we've got a great program for you here today. Really looking forward to it. To it. Uh, joining us will be Albert Tenuta, pathologist in field crops with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. No stranger to many of you. Also, Rob Miller, Regional Technical Services Manager in Eastern Canada for BSF. And as well, for the farmer perspective, we've got Mike Miller with Miller Family Farms. He's in Elgin County. With this range of Ontario experts, uh, we are going to cover a lot of ground to help you get ready for your 2022 corn crop. Hard to believe that planting is uh, not too far around the corner. It feels like harvest just ended. We're also going to be hearing about a new corn fungicide today called Veltima. Today, our experts will cover a wide range of topics. We'll cover agronomic deci decisions, including so, uh, fields or hybrid selection, tillage, crop rotation and disease identification, and management. We'll take a closer look at identifying corn diseases and review some small plot data as well as field scale results on northern corn leaf blight and as well tar spot, which we're hearing more and more about and Albert's going to shed some light on. We'll get a gore perspective on how to also maximize corn yield, which I know you always, you out there, you always appreciate the farmer perspective. We'd like to end the webinar today with time to answer your questions. The Q&A is always uh, one of the favorite parts of these BSF webinars we've been doing across the country. To submit a, a question, just type into the chat box and it'll appear on the screen at the end of our discussion. Also mention where exactly in the province you are from. We'll have our experts answer the questions during the Q&A period that I'll facilitate. Also for those of you that are certified crop advisors or certified crop science consultants, You'll receive one CU credit for attending this webinar today. If you registered an earlier date and forgot to include your numbers when you signed in, be sure to contact Ag Solutions Customer Care at 877-371-BSF. That is 877-371-2273. Also want to mention the BSF is a sponsor of the Corn School at realagriculture.com, so check that out at Corn School. Com. Let's get to our first speaker. It's Albert Tenuta, field crop and pathologist. I almost said entomologist. I want to give you more credit there, Albert. You got oh. enough problems. We'll, we'll stick with pathology. Uh, he's a field crop pathologist with OMAFRA. He's actively involved with many large North American regional disease management research projects and extension initiatives. These include the Crop Protection Network, the S. Uh, SCN Coalition, the Star Tar Spot Working Group, as well as others. Albert, let's talk about the 2021 growing season. I think you have some data you're going to show us on tar spot and overview of the, overview of the disease, including identification, when it arrived, and uh, where exactly it is in, in the province of Ontario. So I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, Sean, and everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, as Sean mentioned, uh, we spent a lot of time this past year talking about uh, tar spot and, um, you know, following it through the season and progression, not only this year, but prior to um, what we saw in, in 2021 as well. And, um, you know, tar spot's been on the radar in Ontario, you know, even prior to its original introduction in 2015 into the Illinois, um, Indiana uh, area, just south of Lake Michigan and that. And since that initial a find in 2015. It's continued to move um, both, you know, west, but also east and north into into Ontario as well. This in in 2020, it, it wasn't unexpected. We've seen that movement into Michigan. It's an airborne disease. It can reside in the field and residues as well. But for for our risk, primarily, it's that airborne movement of the spores. And we have such a big load of overwintering spores throughout the Midwest, and particularly that Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois area, the Great Lakes Basin, that we have that potential for those spores to move in. And in 2020, late September, we did find it in um, Chatham-Kent in the Ridgetown area, and then around Rodney, around where Mike and I are as well, was a hot spot, and as well as Essex, um, Elgin, Middlesex, 
and Lambton as well. And going into this past year, we weren't really sure what to expect in 2021. We knew that it had the potential to overwinter based on what happened in, in the Midwest. So we knew we'd see some uh, early infection, but we're still primarily expecting those spores from, from the US. And what we did end up seeing was in you know, July 2nd, it arrived uh, quite early, um, or we saw it in, in, you know, in our fields in the Rodney area with Mike there, and, um, and it did overwinter as expected. And that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And as you can see from the map here, that not only did we see it by the end of the season in that lower uh, five counties, but it expanded right over into the Simcoe, Simcoe area into Niagara as well. So it is over winter in other parts of uh, the Southwest as well. The really interesting thing, as Sean mentioned, the whole idea around identification of uh, of this disease is it's pretty pretty simple and and straightforward to to identify and I'm having some mouse issues here, but you can see that it's called tar spot. It looks like tar, it's so I'd, hence we call it tar spot. It has these uh, stroma we call them or those tar spot uh, lesions that you see on, on the leaves themselves. That's where the spores are produced and that's where they're released within the season. And this disease is what we call polycyclic. So it has multiple cycles so every seven to 14 days or so it can release new spores and that's why it's such an important economically important disease and it can build up quite quite rapidly because of that pr um, production of those spores and the amount of spores so we're talking like millions of spores that can can be produced in that so from an identification standpoint on your leaves uh, um, ears um, as well as uh, stalks you can see these black tar spot lesions on there. They can be round, they can be irregular shaped, but they're usually individual and in that. The other symptom that we often will see later on in the season is what we call fish eye lesions. And these ones have that stroma or dark tar spot, but around them what you'll see is a tan uh, lesion and then a dark border. And it looks like a fish eye and hence we call it fish eye. This usually occurs later on in the season and we've seen it in Ontario, both in 2020 and 2021. Now, is it related to genetics, uh, tolerance, resistance within the hybrid itself, environmental conditions? Uh, there's, you know, there's a little bit of debate there or so, but we can see both of these uh, uh, symptoms on, on the leaves typical of, of tar spot. What happened in 2021? We had, favorable environmental conditions for sure. And, you know, Mike uh, can attest to this, we had exceptional moisture this year in the Rodney, um, southwestern Ontario areas, you know, in uh, July 8th, you know, June 8th, July 8th, and, and into August, we had, you know, rain events of four, five, six inches of rain. So we had high moisture levels um, in the area. What really drives this disease is, you know, temperature, we often talk about moderate temperatures, you know, that 20, 25 degrees Celsius or so, as well as uh, free moisture and that. But really drives this disease is not only those wet conditions, but more importantly, the leaf wetness, and particularly at nighttime and high humidity. And those seven to eight hours of leaf wetness really drive the disease. And in the weather station that we had set up, at our Rodney location on Mike's farm there, I believe we had out of 90, 95 days, you know, all but two or three of them did not meet that parameter. So we had perfect environmental conditions. You can almost say perfect storms, not only in Southwestern Ontario in our area, but throughout much of the, the lower portion of the province, which really drove that disease. And we started seeing it not only in the southwest but then we started seeing it move as well and one of the tools that that we use to assist us in in tracking the disease both in 2020 where we targeted our, our scouting efforts to to find out where tar spot was in late september in 2020 but also in 2021 is this uh, app developed by the university of wisconsin damon smith my colleague it's called tar spotter and what this disease does is takes local weather information, ties that into the biology and the development of the tar spot fungus, and looks at the risk factors. And so if you look at, 
uh, this map here, this was captured on August 17th, and it looked at the risk factors for, or the risk of tar spot development in um, throughout the Southwest here. And you can see throughout, this was in August, you know, we're looking at 80s to 90s um, um, risk factors here. Um, and, you know, earlier than that, we were up to into the 90s for much of, of the area as well. And so we followed and utilized uh, tar spotter known not only for scouting, but it's a, a tool that can be utilized for fungicide application too to assess risk in that. Um, but you can see that as the as what we saw in the field, we started seeing the tar spotter showing the southern portion being highest risk. That's where we started seeing um, the disease development early, particularly along the Lake Erie uh, North Shore here, and then started to expand into, you know, Perth, Huron, Gray, Bruce, and then over into the Niagara's, and as I said, up into Simcoe. And as we looked at the track, the disease through through the aft through tar spotter, and that we started seeing those areas become higher risk. So this is a tool that we can utilize, and one I would suggest it's a download on on your uh, phone, uh, you know, either Android or Apple platform. So it's been a great tool for us to, to assess the disease. Um, another thing that we did a lot of this year and with the help of Mike, we were able to go into a, a location that had tar spot in 2020, overwintered corn on corn in this particular case so that we could, um, you know, have higher success of potentially having some tar spot in that field. We had some residue in there, again, to promote uh, potential um, development of, of the disease. And one thing you should notice right off the bat from, from this image here is that how quickly, with the favorable environmental conditions, things can, can change quite quickly. And we saw um, in August, you know, end of August, uh, both here and in Mike's fields, we could see that the disease started uh, down low and started working up. Um, the canopy up into, you know, the ear leaf and above. And then as we started getting more disease development, again, higher, um, more favorable environmental conditions, we can see how quickly in the two weeks that changed quite quickly. Um, and this is very typical of what they've seen in the U.S. and the Midwest. You know, 2018, they were seeing 20 to 60 bushel yield losses. Last year on some irrigated land, they were seeing 100 bushel losses in Indiana and that but seeing that 20 to 60 to 80 bushel uh, losses isn't unexpected. Um, it can occur. In most cases, you're, you're looking at anywhere from a five to 30 bushel uh, yield loss, depending on, on the hybrid selected. And you can see here, um, our top portion of the field plot area had what we would call a more susceptible hybrid than a more partially resistant or tolerant hybrid on the bottom. And you can see the difference here in that the susceptible succumbed to the disease quicker. You can see the fungicide applications that were most effective um, kept that greening longer and hence helped us um, on the yield side as well. But just the hybrid selection could delay the disease. But even in this case, under these favorable conditions, um, both the, the hybrid tolerance as well as the fungicide in this case, you know, didn't provide complete control. So this disease is one that we got to be on top of and, and be aware of and that. And so one of the things we've been working with is, um, as, as Sean had mentioned, many of these larger regional projects. And this is a capture of some of the data from, from this past year where Ontario, along with Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin, we're looking at various fungicides um, throughout uh, those regions. And the consistency of what we saw in 2021 is very similar to previous years. We see for certain uh, fungicides that have performed very well and consistently over the years uh, compared to some others. And you can see here with our tar spot severity on the left and uh, with the fungicides on the bottom, you can see our untreated uh, control here, which was around 25% across all of the locations. For us, we were seeing you know 50% or more in certain uh, plots and certain treatments as well. And you can see some of these products are not available 
in Ontario as of yet, but many of the most effective and and that products are available in Ontario. And as you shift across, you can see that we're lowering our disease levels um, based on on the fungicide applications. And in particularly, if we go to the back, to the far right over here, we can see three products that have consistently been very effective in, in the U.S. trials previously and as, again in, in 2021, one being Rivatec. Um, it contains the Rivasol a, a active ingredient, and, and Rob will talk about that as well. Not available at this time in, in Ontario. Veltima, which did get registration, and, and, and Rob will talk about it more, has, again, performed very well, as well as Delero Complete here. So these results are very consistent with previous years. And, and the good news here for, from our perspective is that we have very good fungicides that are available and registered in Ontario right now that can help us with, with tar spot. The timing on this application was that VTR1 application as well. So one, one application um, product uh, timing here as well. If we look specifically at our Ontario location at, at Mike's there, again, you can see the impact of this disease and, and the fungicide responses as well here at this one location. On the bottom, we can see the amount of disease and we were looking at the amount of tar spot on, on the ear leaf. So as you go farther to the right, you're getting more disease. And on the left, as we move up, that the yield is there as well. You can see our no fungicide application had the highest amount of disease and low levels of, of, of yield as well. And you can see we had a group of fungicides on down here that um, you know suppressed the disease a bit. You know the yield performance was was there as well. But you know the goal here is to be in the top left corner, right, where we have the higher yields, lower disease levels. If we can control the disease with an effective fungicide as well as say with a hybrid, we're able to reduce the impact of, of both the symptoms as well as as the yield side. And you can see again those same products that uh, were um, have been consistently effective across um, previously in the U.S. are also performed quite quite well in Ontario. So, as I mentioned, the good news from from our perspective and one of the most important aspects this past year was to a to see how tar spot would develop in Ontario, and we saw under environmental conditions, favorable environmental conditions, we were able to get significant tar spot uh, development in certain fields. Um, as well, which surprised me because I thought we'd have a one or two year buffer as they saw in the US where it took about three years or more to see see these type of yield losses is there. We do see some differences with hybrids as well. So that's a benefit uh, that we do have. But more importantly, we do have some effective fungicides that not only can help us on the tar spot side of things, but other diseases as well. So I think, I'll leave it at that right now, Sean. It, well, great stuff, Albert. You know, Albert, I, I got to commend you. You you were on this one extremely, extremely early. I can remember us doing interviews uh, yourself and Bern Tobin when you know really tar spot was kind of a real unknown commodity here in in Eastern Canada. So I really do appreciate uh, the the research that you've been doing on this. Um, I got a couple questions for you before we move on. Um, what do you think the timelines are for the disease to move into eastern Ontario and Quebec? Well, we're starting to see that expansion going into New York now, so into that Niagara Falls area in New York. We see it in Pennsylvania towards close to, to Pittsburgh and that. So we know that the disease being or the pathogen being airborne will move. And now that we're into, you know, that Toronto area, north of Toronto, Barrie and, and that, you know, the spores will be available and they will move over. Now the the question will become the environmental conditions. So we know it will find its way into Eastern Ontario, find its way in into Quebec as well. And I wouldn't be surprised to, to see that even this upcoming year. Um, again, as it overwinters and develops and becomes endemic, which it is now, you're gonna see that encroachment movement over just similar to what we've seen in the US. But the key there is to be out there scouting, find the disease as early as possible and assess your risks. How about weather models to determine and predict, you know, the 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 level of infection? You you mentioned tar spotter. What else is being worked on? Well, there's a number of other ones that are being worked on. Um, you know, many of them are 
proprietary and, and that. Um, you know, we've seen some of them. They're not at the same level as what we're seeing with Tar Spotter right now. Uh, the good thing is that Tar Spotter has been, it's based on the Sporecaster model for white mold as well and some others. Uh, platforms as well. And it's been, as I said, University of Wisconsin with Damon Smith, it's been in the process right off the bat since 2015. So the good part there is it's been um, tweaked over the years. It's getting better and better every year. And the important thing when you're thinking about application apps and, and these prediction models and all that stuff, it's great to predict things, but you got to be able to validate them with real in real time in the field observations as well, both to assess the effectiveness of, of those apps. And with the tar spotter, we also have those maps that we produce there through the IPM pipe is tracking tar spot daily throughout the summer. And we can use that to validate those models as well. So some of our others are being developed, but tar spotter is our, our gold standard right now. Great stuff. Uh, if you have questions for Albert, please put them in the question box. Mention where exactly your farm is located. Albert's going to be back uh, later on here in the program to answer more of my questions and in yours as well. So, Albert, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Rob Miller. Rob is the Regional Technical Services Manager for Eastern Canada with BASF. Uh, with more than 20 years of research experience, Rob has expertise in herbicide, fungicide, insecticides, and seed treatment for all row crops. Rob, we've seen some interesting data on tar spot from Albert, and there's some new fungicides on the list of control options. Let's talk about them. Perfect. Thanks, John, and uh, great intro by Albert. So um, I'm just going to go right, right at it here and talk about the new one that BSF is bringing to the market called Voltima. So it's going to be new for Canada for the 2022 season. It has been registered in the U.S. for the last couple of seasons. That's why it's been part of the corn disease working group uh, that Albert mentioned. Valtima contains two effective modes of action. The first one is Procrastrobin, which is a group 11 strobal urine fungicide. So the same active ingredient that we get in Headline, Preax, or Headline Amp. But what is really exciting about Valtima is the group three azole uh, called metafluidotriticonazole, which is basically going to be under the brand name Reversol. So basically when we talk about Reversol, we're actually talking about that group three azole fungicide. And Reversol is going to be the backbone of our fungicide and fungicide technology as we move forward. So I've been working with this compound for about the last 10, 12 years. In, uh, in the province of Ontario, and it, it's been really exciting to, uh, to actually see this from all the way from a test tube and bring it to marketplace and see the activity that it does have on tar spot, like, uh, like Albert, Albert mentioned. When we talk about Valtima, you'll probably hear uh, some of the literature and see some of the ads on broader, stronger, longer activity. So what do we actually mean by that? Well, it was actually, Reposol was first registered in the horticulture market under the trade name Sevia. And that is registered on multiple crops, controls a wide range of diseases, and we continue to add more crops and diseases to the label. It has stronger activity because it's very fast acting. It has unique binding affinity and will actually bind to that target site of the protein very quickly. But what really sets Reversol apart is the longer extended residual activity. So it actually uh, can, has this low solubility, gets in the leaf very quickly, and forms these little reservoirs under the leaf surface, and it's slowly and steadily uh, released throughout the leaf, almost like a slow release fertilizer. So that's kind of the, the same type of technology, and it's more steady and consistent uh, release throughout the leaf. For the 2022 season, we're going to be focusing on three major crops, corn, wheat, and potatoes. So potatoes is going to be national, and it's going to be available in jugs for the, the 2022 season. If you want more information, definitely talk to your BSF representative. Uh, this is just kind of a sneak peek or uh, visit our, uh, our website as well for more information. We talked, we heard a lot about uh, Albert Tenuta's plots on tar spot. And I have a short little video here because we work very closely with Mike and Albert on some of these plots. And depending on how fast your internet is, the, the video might be a little bit choppy, but we actually set up time-lapse cameras about a week after Albert and his technicians went in and sprayed the uh, the trials, the small plot trials at Mike's place. And you can see that the Valtima is keeping that plant greener longer. So the application was applied 
at that VTR1 stage and keeping it greener through the uh, grain fill stage. By the time we get to say week six, week seven, you're starting to see even the uh, the tar spot start to move up in that treated area. So the, the Valtima is a great tool and toolbox for managing tar spot, um, but it's not a silver bullet. And as we get into week 10, you can start to see the lodging in that, uh, that susceptible hybrid. And in this particular plot, we actually had a, a 60 bushel yield difference. So I want to make sure that I set the proper expectations here because we're not I'm not saying that every time you spray a fungicide you're going to see that 60 bushel yield response. But it just goes to show that under these high risk scenarios, so the uh, susceptible hybrid, the uh, you know tar spot was present in the area, perfect ideal environmental conditions coming in early uh, being diagnosed prior to that tassel time frame, you know, it was first detected on July 2nd. If left unmanaged, this is where it can actually have an impact, a significant impact on yield. And that's why it's important to really understand this disease. We don't need to fear it, but we just need to know how to understand it so we can manage it accordingly. But overall, some really nice uh, response and special thanks to, uh, to Albert and Mike for doing that. I learned so much uh, from uh, Albert on uh, on tar spot for this season and I was there on probably uh, twice three times a week looking at a lot of these trials and the biggest surprise to me was on the the standability so it's no surprise you know Albert mentioned with the susceptible and tolerant hybrids there's there's differences in terms of their susceptibility and with the untreated susceptible hybrid we actually were just there the same day that Albert uh, and his technicians were there, uh, Cheryl and, and Jay, doing the push test. So what happens with the push test is you actually uh, walk down the, the uh, uh, walk beside the plant, you extend your arm, uh, 20 plants per plot. If it falls over, you basically mark it with a check mark. If it pops back up, then you just keep on moving. And you can see after we conducted, or after they conducted that, uh, that push test in the untreated, no surprise, right? You know, that disease came in early in the season. We're starting to see differences in terms of plant standability. And this was about uh, seven weeks after application. Biggest surprise to me and the biggest key learning for me is uh, with the differences in the hybrid. And Albert mentioned that there's susceptible and tolerant hybrids. We actually saw more lodging in that tolerant hybrid versus the susceptible hybrid. And I would have actually thought it was the opposite. And when you actually look at these trials after that push test, you know, the untreated was going down, but there's still that benefit of applying that Valtima fungicide in terms of plant standability um, with this particular hybrid as well. So the, the more tolerant hybrid still had tar spot. We noticed it about two to three weeks later after the susceptible hybrid. But I've talked to a lot of growers and they said, well, I'm using a, a tolerant hybrid. I don't need to worry about spraying a fungicide. There's more benefits or there's added benefits to using that fungicide um, in terms of plant standability, uh, widespread disease control. So if we if you only focus on controlling one disease, that's where you can actually get burned. And and I don't know what was actually going on in this plot. Maybe it was some some anthracnose leaf rot or, or or sorry anthracnose stock rot going on with this uh, particular hybrid. But that's just one uh, one key learning. Then probably the major thing that stood out for me uh, this year in some of the trials. So I work with a lot of small scale trials working with Albert, and then also the large scale trial. So this is actually a drone sh shot of the trials that we've been talking about today. So you can see that the trials that were set up in the, the bottom part of the, uh, of the uh, plot, but then you actually look at the large scale trial and that's the one that Mike set up. So I won't uh, set his, uh, take away any of his thunder, but we also had about 50 of these large scale research authorization, 20 grower, uh, 20 acres grower applied trials replicated strips throughout the field. And I'm gonna go through a little bit of that data here and uh, show you a couple photos of that. So this is one of those trials that was taken from the Leamington Rodney area. And you can see that again, large scale trials replicated through the field. And especially when we're trying to find out as much information as possible, we want multiple reps through the field. And you can see very similar to the trials that the, and the data that Albert presented, as we got into that middle September timeframe, September 10th to September 16th, that's where it really started to ramp up. And that's where we really started to see that plant shut down prematurely uh, due to that disease. So this was actually uh, right after application, this was one of the first fields outside of the Rodney area that we actually found tar spot. 
And I have another video here where we actually played around with some uh, time-lapse cameras with drones. So again, uh, depending on your internet speed, it might be a little bit choppy. So we actually had a drone that had GPS coordinates and it flew the same coordinates uh, every week for a three week period. And it actually took pictures of the field and of the strips. And you can see the differences between that Baltima versus the untreated check. So this was applied by ground. And as we got into that September 16th timeframe, you know, we started to see some the color change, but by September 24th, that's where the tar spot basically took over that entire field. So we wanna make sure, again, we set the proper expectations with, with managing uh, this disease with fungicides is to keep it greener longer during that green field period. Here's another angle from the different field and you start to see those patches again. So this field was actually soybeans last year. So it wasn't corn on corn, it was soybeans after, or it was corn after soybeans. And last year there's a lot of volunteer corn there. So we don't know if the tar spot lesions, you know, overwintered in the volunteer corn or if it blew in from the states or if it's a combination of both. But that's just something that we should uh, look to manage in the future is, is controlling that volunteer corn, uh, trying to break up that cycle. But again, some really nice, uh, some nice results that we have. You can really start to see the, uh, the lodging um, in the untreated in those patches in the field. So that, that was some, uh, some neat stuff. And, and you're probably thinking, okay, I'm showing a lot of these pretty pictures. What does the data look like? And when I look at large scale research or when I look at yield data, I really like looking at large scale uh, replicated trials. And you can see when we look at uh, the results that we have from last year, we have 34 sites across uh, Ontario and into Quebec. We follow that typical piano graph, right? So it, it's you always get some field variability there. But where we actually start to see the differences with Valtima is in that where that blue bar is. So a lot of those areas are kind of in that 10 to 20 bushel range. Um, we had more on the right side of the graph where there was actually tar spot present, but we're getting more consistency out of these fungicides. We're learning where to target some of these fields where we get the maximum response to that fungicide application. And we're focusing on those fields with the higher yield potential. So overall, some really nice responses. We always get, like I said, we always get some, some variability there, but I really like focusing on the center part of the graph because that's really uh, tells a lot of the story. We also get a lot of questions on, okay, when you know this late season stay green effect, especially as we, we have these plants greener longer into October, how does that affect dog? And we actually did collected samples from all these research authorizations. Um, we had eight of the trials that were below detectable limits in the untreated and the and as well as the treated area. And we had 15 sites where we actually were able to detect that that dawn in the grain. And you can see that you know when we average them all out, we actually decrease it slightly with uh, with Baltima. So I will say that if you are in a high risk gibber, gibberella or you're concerned about dawn that is where you're going to want to top Valtina up with a product like Caramba, um, just for greater consistency. But overall, the goal of these research authorizations and collecting this data was to show that the late season stay green plant health as we got into October and closer to harvest, that did not increase dawn in the grain. So overall, some really nice uh, results from this year from our trials and special thanks to the growers this year that, uh, that did those uh, trials. We talked a lot about tar spot, but we also want to talk a, a little bit about the other key leaf diseases. And the main one is that we used to be dealing with was northern corn leaf blight. That was the, the major leaf disease, especially when we started to bring this product to market and do a lot of this research about eight, 10 years ago. And as we think back, you know, northern corn leaf blight about five years ago really had a major impact on, on disease and, uh, and our yields back then. So we actually have been working with, with Albert and, and Dave Hooker and a lot of other uh, uh, third-party researchers looking at inoculated trials. So what actually happens is we inoculate the trials with northern corn leaf blight. So about waist-high, shoulder-high corn, we go in there and actually um, drop in the inoculum into the whirl. And by the time it comes out and the leaves start to unroll, it's usually present at the time of application. So when we look at some of our... Uh, inoculated trials that we did. And again, this is uh, working with Ridgetown Campus, so Dave Hooker and, and Albert Tenuta. Uh, we had the non-inoculated check and then the inoculated check 
and then all the fungicides are actually inoculated. And when we look at that inoculum there, and the goal of the fungicides is actually just to bring it back to that red line. So basically bring it back to that non-inoculated check. And you can see with the commercial fungicides, you know, they all did a pretty good job at uh, reducing that northern corn leaf blight. But where Voltima really shines, and especially that Reversol component, is on that northern corn leaf blight. And we actually had lower disease levels in the Voltima inoculated treatment than we did the non-inoculated check. So that was a big surprise to me, uh, you know, or big key learning. Uh, this isn't just a one-hit wonder. We've seen this multiple years uh, across multiple locations in the U.S. as well. This Voltima would be a leaf disease specialist, and it's consistent across multiple leaf diseases. So northern corn leaf blight, tar spot, leaf rust would look very similar to this as well. When you look at uh, maybe other products are, are available on the market, they might be good on, uh, you know, they might be really good on one disease and then not as strong on other diseases. And that consistency is really key when it comes to controlling and, and managing these leaf diseases. Albert, I'm not sure if you, you've been working with this compound uh, or, you know, Northern Corn Leaf Light, any other comments? Yeah, no, as, as Rob mentioned, uh, you know, all the products provided us uh, significant uh, impact or on disease severity, as well as on, on yield there. A couple of um, key takeaways, as Rob mentioned, um, is that you know on the Veltima side there, as you can see with the severity here, it, it drastically reduced uh, the severity, but you know also on the yield side, right, Rob? We did see that mm -hmm. impact on yield and uh, significantly higher yield than, than the others as, as well. So all the products did work well. Um, the interesting component too is if we look at the timing aspect, um, this was a timing trial as well um, in that the all the products um, worked better at the VTR1 application. And remember, this are high disease pressure uh, fields. As you can see, almost you know 80 some odd percent um, for northern corn leaf blight. So these are heavy disease pressure fields. Of the other four fungicides, they all worked better at that tassel application, which is our traditionally most consistent application timing. The Veltima was interesting that it didn't matter if it was the V12 or the VT, we saw the same um, level of control uh, for yield and, and that as well. So it, um, it gave us a little bit more flexibility in, in the timing side as well. So it does work well, but this just adds that importance. As Rob brought up the fact that, you know, when you're selecting a hybrid, we're often looking at yield. I want you to look at disease ratings as well and all that, but, you know, standability, that kind of stuff, stock rot uh, tolerances and that are also important. So you want to take into consideration all of the factors around that hybrid uh, choices, but at the same time, tar spots, the big important, you know, the, the new disease out there, it's getting a lot of attention, but don't forget about northern corn leaf like gray leaf spot, gibberella and dawn as well. That has to also be considered when you're, you're putting your full integrated disease management uh, program together for corn. Great yeah, stuff, guys. Hey, hey, Rob, I got a couple questions. Um, yep. Can I tank mix uh, an insecticide with Veltima to take care of something like uh, Western bean cutworm? Uh, yeah, so we often get that question a lot. So uh, it is compatible with a number of different uh, insecticides and different products. Uh, we've been working with this, been registered in the States for a number of years. We haven't heard of any uh, any compatibility issues. The thing is when you're tank mixing with an insecticide, make sure the pest level is there or the pest is actually there and above thresholds. We don't wanna be making you know, blanket applications of insecticides. We do need to take that integrated pest management approach to, especially from the insect side. Uh, so that pest must be present and time it based on the insecticide. There's more flexibility with the fungicide on leaf disease and time it based on the insecticide. Okay, good stuff there. Uh, how, how about adding an adjuvant? Uh, yep, so you, an adjuvant is not required with Voltima. Um, and you also want to be a little bit concerned with, uh, or a little bit aware of adding too much to the tank, especially in that pre-tassel time frame. So if you add an adjuvant to a fungicide uh, pre-tassel, especially a non-ionic sur uh, surfactant, 
that's when you can run into issues with arrested ear syndrome if it's applied prior to tassel. So arrested ear, also known as beer can corn, beer bottle corn, you get some ear uh, deformation. Uh, definitely no adjuvants or anything prior to tassel, um, but for with Valtima, you're okay to apply it uh, pre-tassel, full tassel, just don't add the adjuvant. Okay, awesome. Appreciate it, guys. Great stuff, Rob. Love the data and the pictures. The pictures are pretty telling. Our final presenter is Mike Miller. Mike graduated from the University of Guelph and operates Miller Family Farms in Elkin County in southwestern Ontario. His farm business includes a cash crop operation, custom spraying, and egg laying operation. Mike is particularly passionate about crop production, especially corn. Who doesn't love corn? Okay, Mike, uh, over to you. Morning, Sean. Uh, thanks, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody and uh, big thanks to DSF for inviting me to uh, present today. Um, I guess a little bit about a uh, little bit about our operation. Uh, we're located just south of Rodney. Um, I farm with my dad. Um, we've got soil types that are mostly sand to loamy sand. Um, a lot of old tobacco farms. Uh, I would say probably half the good half of our acres are uh, old tobacco farms, so really sandy soil. Um, induced to growing a lot of corn, um, not so much for soybeans. Um, yeah, we uh, we've had a lot of farms now in corn for probably about 10, 10 to 12 years, and you know we we continue to see higher yields every year. Um, and uh, fungicides have actually played a pretty inter integral role in uh, the success of our continuous corn. Um, like Rob said, we don't spray every acre every year. It's uh, you got to do your scouting and and be careful with that. But uh, we also deal with a lot of uh, western bean cutworm too. So a lot of the time we're making that pass uh, through the field on on a majority of our acres. So. Um, yeah, plant health for us is is uh, really important. Um, we're trying to select hybrids that uh, that can tolerate a lot of disease pressure in, uh, in especially these corn on corn fields. So, so why do we use fungicides? I think the I think the best uh, starting point is yield. I think everyone uh, the first question that they ask is is it going to pay me back? So. Um, as time goes on, we, we see these uh, diseases like northern corn leaf blight and uh, tar spot. Um, it's becoming even more important to, uh, to make sure that those uh, fungicides are applied to uh, to fields that need it. So um, this year we saw probably on average, I would say a 20 to 25 bushel response to uh, an applied fungicide. We use a lot of headline amp and brahma this year, and uh, we are pretty pleased with the results of uh, those yield checks. Um, I think it's really important that every field gets those yield checks uh, just to reinforce the need for that, that product. I mean, every variety you plant, every, every field you plant should have checks so that you can verify what you're doing is actually going to make you money and, and uh, give you the results that you're looking for. So to tie that in, I guess uh, quality is also important to us because we do have, uh, we do feed some corn to livestock. So we are, uh, we're always striving to get the highest quality and best test weight that we can from that. And uh, quite oftentimes fungicides add the quality that we're looking for. So lastly, I guess uh, sustainability is, is also important. Uh, quite often we're harvesting corn into the end of November and December and uh, everyone knows that that late November gale uh, usually knocks, knocks a lot of corn down and we're trying to target those hybrids that we know we're going to leave out uh, a little bit later. Um, standability is important, fungicides not the silver bullet. Um, when we're trying to select standability we're intentionally leaving out the varieties that uh, offer the best uh, best late season standing so so here's the this is actually the field uh, that albert had his plots in uh it's been corn for three or four years now i guess um it's an old tobacco farm well tiled but it's uh it does seem to have a lot of tar spot this is actually where 
where I first found it in the fall of 2020, and uh, I don't think Albert could get there fast enough. I've never seen a van drive so fast when I called him, but uh, yeah, at any rate, uh, <laughs> yeah, we found it in this corner here, and right on the leeward side of the house lot that was there, and it seemed like as you went further east, there was less pressure, and as you went in the field, um, this is in the fall of 2020, there was actually very little pressure, so um was kind of hopeful that this would be the only field that we found it in this year um but that was not the case so at any rate this here is uh just an example of the different treatments that were applied in this field uh, the green is the veltima the red is the second half of veltima that we applied at about r3 i believe it is uh, 10th august something like that uh pink was headline amp corumba and then the red is uh the veltima the second half again so we had quite a nice uh, variety here and of uh, different treatments to try and get us some better data on how uh, on how these fungicides work in combat and car spots. So, um, this here is a harvest map of that treatment. Um, there was some really good data came out of here that I'll show in a little bit, but you can actually see several of the uh, treatment or the uh, check strips through this field with uh, significant yield loss. Uh, from no application of fungicide. So and lastly, you want to make sure that you have good data from those uh, from those yield checks. Make sure your combine combine calibrated and uh, and they're actually looking at it and making decisions based off that. <clears throat> Sorry. So here we have uh, an example of a variety, uh, we typically do a test plot with both Pioneer and uh, DeKalb. Bob Thurwall is a great uh, asset as a scrap roots ant. Uh, they help us get, get better plots in every year. And uh, this year was a really good, uh, really good results from it in terms of tar spot severity and uh, susceptibility in different varieties. Um, this one here is just a particular hybrid that I picked uh, it's P0806 it seemed to have really good tolerance um, and I should add that this was no fungicide on this field I wanted to see just how each hybrid reacts to uh, a favorable environment to tar spot um, I think next year what I want to do is split that uh, test plot in half and do half fungicide half not and you should be able to collect some pretty good data from that I didn't do that this year that's one thing I wish I would have done now but uh, anyhow, there was some pretty severe tar spot in this field. It was no tilled corn on corn. Um, so I, it really produced, and it was planted late. So it was a, a really good environment just to see how, how bad some varieties got. And they really did get bad. So um, now having said that, the yield data from those, uh, the yield data from those that plot there, it didn't necessarily correlate a susceptible hybrid to lost yield. So it's it's kind of one of those things where just because it does get, uh, it has higher susceptibility to tar spot doesn't mean that it's uh, gonna yield less. You just have to understand that maybe you need to manage a certain hybrid a little bit differently than you would a, a hybrid that's really tolerant. Maybe it's a potential for two apps. It's uh, one of those things uh, that you have to kind of learn as you go. So. Um, this here on the right is from that test field. It was two apps of Veltima. And this particular hybrid here, um, it's one of my favorites. We grow it on probably 20 to 30% of our corn acres every year. Uh, it yields really well, stands well. Um, the problem is with it is it's, it uh, really is susceptible to northern corn leaf blight and apparently tar spots. So um, it's one of those that you grow it knowing basically that you're going to be spraying it with fungicide because it is one of those hybrids that it yields like gangbusters but you you have to be on top of it in terms of management so um yeah it this one really uh showed uh susceptibility to northern corn leaf blight before and we knew that but this year it seemed like uh it was one of the worms for a tar spot but it did still yield okay so um I guess one comment would be if you're scouting for tar spot and you're trying to do it quickly, say if you're trying to time sprays or anything like that, um, a helpful 
thing would be to carry a good pair of binoculars around and you can actually see from the road at early infection uh you can pick it out pretty easily it's one of the good things about the disease i guess it's not that hard to find so if you're you know trying to get acres straight and uh still do a good job it's it's kind of a quick way to do it but it's uh it might give you a little bit easier time uh, scouting so working with albert i don't know but uh he does bring good food and drinks so. um no, it, it was a really fun year actually uh no one wants to have these diseases but uh, the chance to work with albert and having him so close is uh really a, a huge uh, benefit to us we spend a lot of time in the field together and uh, really value those times so um this here is the same field uh, i wish i had the pictures adjust a little bit better now but at any rate uh, this field here is the same field that uh, albert had his small plots in and you can see here uh, the untreated basically went from alive to completely dead in a matter of 10 days it was just unbelievable uh, how fast this thing can spread and you got to really be watching for it uh, i've never seen anything take hold so fast and and it just kills the plant so quickly um, that it really has no time to fill the kernels out and uh, gain that kernel weight. I know probably a lot of you saw the uh, presentation by Tony Vine there, and it's kind of the linear uh, adding of weight. And if you cut that last three weeks of grain fill off, you're really killing your yield. And uh, you could see it with smaller ears, small kernels, uh, deep denting, just no weight to them at all. So it was, yeah, it was pretty staggering to see that. And, so this here is one app of Veltima, and you can see the difference between, these are all taken about 50 feet apart. So you can see it in Rob's picture there, uh, the strips that were going through the field, those were untreated, uh, untreated passes. But, uh, so we did see in this field about a 25 bushel uh, advantage to the Veltima over the untreated, uh, untreated pass. Uh, that was pretty consistent with what we saw in most fungicide applications. Uh, some are a little bit less, but we did see up to 40 bushels uh, in some of those applications. And the two apps, it was kind of surprising because uh, we we could see a visual difference, like right to the row, um, just the plant health that was, that was there. And I thought, okay, this is gonna give us another 10 bushels kind of thing, but uh, it only gave us about three bushels. So, I mean, it, it at $8 corn, it pays, for the application but not much more so um running a sprayer through the field at passive corn is is pretty hard on the sprayer it's not definitely not free to run out either so i would call that a, yeah kind of a, a wash at that point so at five dollar corn it's a loss for sure but um yeah that was kind of the probably the most surprising thing for us was i figured the second app was really going to give us uh, a big boost but it but it didn't so and I should clarify both of those applications were Veltima. So maybe there's something else you can spray that's a cheaper product on the second pass. Maybe it will help. I don't know. It's uh, something we're going to have to keep looking at as time goes on. So for 2022, uh, I think one of the key things is, is hybrid selection. If you have a hybrid that's working well on your farm, I don't I don't think the threat of tar spot is enough to stop growing it completely yet. If you know it's susceptible, know that when you're planning it and uh, kind of plan accordingly to you know, make spring easy, I guess, if, uh, if you're gonna place it in a field that's a little bit less damaged for spring, something like that, right? But uh, yeah, hybrid selection, there's definitely a few. I would say uh, if you don't put a test plot in, I would definitely say you wanna do that. Um, I know it's a pain to put it in, but uh, it gives you a lot of valuable data and it gives you valuable uh, insight into which hybrids might give you a better result. So, um, and it gives you something to do in the summertime. Uh, you can go in and check it every so often instead of having to drive 20 miles to a plot. But uh, um, tillage, from what we found, we had a mix of everything we do some disc gripping, we do no-till, corn on corn, we do no-till uh, after soybeans, we do conventional tillage. So it's a, we kind of take a field-by-field -field approach to tillage. Um, we're trying strip till, we're playing around with that. I don't know if it's uh, going to give you any more or less uh, susceptibility to the tar spot. It didn't seem to matter this year, no matter where you were. 
uh, you pretty much got it. So um, it didn't seem to have a measurable effect on uh, the tar spot severity. So uh, fungicide use, I think it's going to be more important than ever. Uh, that's tied into weather too. I mean, obviously, if you have a drought or conditions not favorable, you may you may not need as much uh, or a higher percentage of your acres to be sprayed. But I would be really careful uh, if you have a have a wet year like we did this year and a lot of humidity and wetness uh, to not look very hard at spraying a lot of acres of fungicide. So. And also fertility, if you have a good field of corn that's not lacking in other ways, it's just like people with uh, illness, right? If you have a healthy person that's that's able to combat diseases better, it's definitely a good thing. And I think that's very important that you build the foundation for a healthy plant right from the get-go. Hey, so great that, stuff. I guess uh, that's our presentation. So. Yeah, great, great stuff. You, you answered a... Pretty much all my questions. Um, <laughs> I, I got a follow up though for you. You mentioned uh, uh, test strips and check strips. Um, how, how big, when you're doing that kind of testing in the field on a field scale, how, how big of a strip are you leaving? Is one pass? Or are you doing more? What are you doing? Uh, it depends on the field. Like if it's a 50 acre piece, I'll leave, you know, I'll turn half the sprayer off and because uh, we run a 30 foot corn head and a 100 foot sprayer. So it doesn't match up perfectly, but. Uh, Typically, I'll, you know, on a larger field, 100 to 300 acre fields, I'll run, you know, two, three check strips. And if I have multiple varieties in that field, I'll run one in each variety kind of thing. So I don't want to do too much because then you're giving a field on a bigger percentage of your acres. But yeah, enough that you can get good data from. Not running a research farm, but getting some tangible, practical information back uh, makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah, every, every field is a, is a research farm, basically, right? So. Yeah, that's true. Okay, Albert, uh, we heard from Mike about the results of his two-pass fungicide application. What is your experience with the two-pass programs in the U.S. with a pre-tassel V12 application followed by an application at R3? Yeah, so that's the big question, right? And we didn't have time this year or space to, to, to do the application timing side of things. Before we even get into that, remember for Ontario, Getting off of that VTR1, that Gibberella Dawn timing is is critically important, right? We saw what happened in 2018 with with Jib and Dawn and that, and so. But of course, we have to look at some other of of the timings, and so many of those earlier applications, whether it is you mentioned the V12 type, there's been V8, V10, and then follow that up with a say an R2, R3 application um, as well. They've been inconsistent um the most consistent one's still been the vtr1 sometimes they've they've worked um but in many cases it is the benefit of that later application more so than the earlier application that that has driven those those benefits and that but again as mike mentioned um you know each field is different you got to pay attention to what's going on in the field and you've got to pay attention to the weather as well um, so as of right now, for most producers, that VTR1 application would be uh, the critically important one there uh, for us. But again, this year in Mike's field there, we saw July 2nd is when we started seeing the disease. We applied July 22nd. We had very little, uh, maybe one or two lesions on the ear leaf at that point. So that was the perfect timing from a disease standpoint, right? Because that's the area that we want to protect. Um, as Mike showed with that second application, that later application, you did definitely see a greening effect, but you didn't see the yield benefit of of that side under those those conditions. So, again, that's where the tar spotter app can can maybe help in that. But as of right now, it's been the main target window is still going to be that VTR one. Great stuff. Hey, Rob, a question for you: Have you looked at any later season applications of fungicide beyond the tassel timing? Uh, yeah, so this year we actually did more, well, we'll, we'll say experimental plots, but it was more revenge spraying because it was uh, kind of like, uh, holy cow, we have uh, tar spot just covered the uh, polluted on the ear leaf. So uh, we, we actually did three field scale comparisons. Uh, two of them were with Valtima, one of them was Headline Ant plus Corumba. 
And I would say we did see some some nice responses in these high risk uh, scenarios. So again, optimal environmental conditions, susceptible hybrids. We saw anywhere between a 15 to 20 bushel yield response uh, between those two programs. But almost like like Albert said, if, if we had have applied earlier, we probably would have seen more of a 25 to 30 bushel response. So, you know, this year it did work out. Um, but again, we in order to maximize your yield potential, we do want to target that that earlier application timing. And some parts of the U.S. as well, you might hear some some things about Faltima saying five feet and treat. Those are some that's like five feet, uh, five foot tall corn. Those are some areas where you know maybe they've been dealing with tar spot for a couple of years and we haven't really uh, you know we're not there yet for for the Ontario market. But the application window for tar spot is wider. So just be if you, if it's the end of R1. Um, you know, you still can, it's too late to spray the, uh, the fungicide for gibberella, but you still see that activity from the, uh, on, on tar spot as well. So the application window is much wider at tar spot or other leaf diseases. Great. Appreciate it. I want to encourage everybody to continue to put questions in the Q and A box. We're going to get to some of those questions here in, in a little bit. Albert, another one for you for managing tar spot and other leaf diseases, where does tillage fit into the equation? And if it does, better in the fall or spring yeah so tillage falls into sort of the crop rotation side of things too is and you know mike mentioned you know various different tillage systems there um in in there and, and didn't see a big difference in terms of the amount of tar spot based on on the the tillage practices in that so when we look at tillage and i'll throw crop rotation in there as i said it can have an impact on the disease particularly the overwintering the endemic a part of it, it has a slight impact in reduction. And the research out of the US has shown that you may reduce it maybe 10% or so, but not enough to, to, to remove that risk for, for tar spot and that. So on its own, not as effective, but as part of an integrated disease management tool, it, it can be beneficial in there. And the, whether it's fall or spring, it's the residue side. Actually, Mike and I had a, a discussion early on this year, right? In that maybe there was too much tillage done in our field and there wasn't a, the, the residue levels were probably what, 20%, 25%, maybe less than that. Um, and I thought, oh, we won't be getting too much, but boy, did it, it didn't matter. Mike, just some thoughts on that? Yeah, like it, it really surprised me. Uh, I kind of figured that the fields with um, longer, extended periods of corn uh, would see a lot a lot more severe uh, disease but it really didn't seem to matter it, it was like a switch flip uh, i guess around the 15th of august maybe that it just exploded and uh, it didn't seem to matter we, we grew a few edibles this year too and and uh or last year and had corn on them and it was within three or four days uh, of each other that yeah, it all seemed to show it. So I don't think that tillage is necessarily, um, you know, I don't think that rotating is going to give you, a, you know, the silver bullet to uh, eliminate it from from your crop. So, yeah. yeah. So remember, when we think of, you know, tillage is primarily there to remove that endemic overwintering population, right? And we may be able to to reduce that a bit, but we have such a big sink of inoculum or spores to the U.S. side, right? On the other side of the border, through Michigan, particular Indiana, Ohio, you know, if you're in the Niagara area now with New York State and that, you know, so as Mike said, you know, that mid-August timeframe, it started when we found it July 2nd, it was the same time that all the way to Iowa, we started seeing tar spots. So it was a big regional effect there. And then those storm fronts that continuously came through um, would bring those spores into, into the province and start depositing them as well. Albert, we heard about the highly scientific push test earlier. Um, when it comes to hybrid selection, how do you evaluate corn hybrids to determine if they are tolerant or susceptible? Yeah, so we had various different, uh, we had 64 different hybrids that uh, we had at Mike's place. In, and basically what we're doing there is assessing disease development over time. And so basically when we first start to see the disease, particularly as we get into that, that uh, BT tassel timing. We want we we follow the disease through and and basically rate uh, the amount of tar spot on there on a percentage 
um, standpoint or on the, say, the ear leaf, et, et, et cetera, so that we can track the disease over time and see what, what reaction. We did see some hybrids that have a bit more tolerance or partial resistance, but by far, most of them had what we would call, you know, various good susceptibility and that, and that's very consistent what, with what the U.S. has, and, and many of the seed companies have that, and you're starting to see some ratings from, from some of those companies that have been evaluating it for three or four years. So it's a work in progress right now, um, but it is very important that when you're looking at hybrids, and Mike mentioned this, every hybrid stands on its own merits, and you have to be um, take that into consideration um, with that. Um, and don't forget, a strong hybrid resistance can overcome some of that favorable disease environment, but it's not the silver bullet right now. What I'm hearing from what you guys continually hear is there's no silver bullet. There, there is a package of things that you need to do to manage a disease like tar spot. Mike, I'll throw to you on the hybrid selection. You mentioned that you had your favorite hybrid. You grow, I think you said about 30% of the acres uh, with that hybrid, I think is what you said. And yep. uh, it has a high susceptibility to, or some sort of susceptibility to tar spot, maybe not enough yep. that would switch out of it. How, how do you balance all this when you're selecting your hybrids and how many hybrids are you putting on the farm? Uh, I would say we're probably growing about I want to say about 10, 10 hybrids, um, no more than like one hybrid won't get more than like you say about 30% of our production. If it's, if it's been a proven, uh, proven hybrid for a lot of years, I'll grow that high. But, uh, yeah, typically it's, uh, yeah, we grow eight, about eight to 10 different hybrids on the farm. Uh, I will say this year in that test plot on average, uh, longer day hybrids seem to stay greener for longer. I don't know if that was just, coincidence or what that is, but um, the, the two top performing hybrids in that plot uh, definitely had good tolerance, I will say that. Um, they're likely going to get a, a fair amount of acres next year, but uh, yeah, like like I say, I don't think uh, any hybrid's going to give you excellent protection without fungicide. I think uh, you got to be pretty aware of that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get to some of the audience questions. It's it's time for uh, that part of the program. As I mentioned, if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A box and also include where you do farm for a reference point for our experts. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, maybe, Albert, I'll throw this one to you. Is there any relationship on the severity of tar spot between different row widths, 20 inch versus 30? Yeah, we haven't seen any anything there. The only thing that it could be is that the environmental conditions might be a bit more favorable in the narrow rows, higher plant populations, just like what we talk about other diseases like white mold, et cetera, like that. Okay, uh, question for you, Rob. Does the new fungicide have white Veltima? I think what we're talking about here. Does it have white mold protection on soys? How about pod and uh, stern blight? Uh, so, Baltima is going to be registered on soybeans. It actually currently is on label, but uh, we're not. That's not really going to be a key focus for this year. Uh, it doesn't have activity on white mold, so that's where you're going to want to use something like Cotegra. Uh, but we are looking at adding it to uh, pot and stem blight, or also known as Fumopsis, uh, to the uh, to the label as well. So I can't remember if that's currently on the label, or but we're looking at it uh, after this year's data. Yeah. Uh, Rob, back to the last question. Have you seen anything, any sort of the trialing and research that BSF's been doing in terms of uh, road width impacts? Uh, no, but the same. Like we we did a couple of research authorizations on 20, uh, 20 acre or 20 row, uh, 20 inch rows, and they were applied by by air. And uh, yeah, we didn't really see much of an, an impact. Uh, we didn't had very low levels of tar spot in that that particular field. So. Okay, cool. A uh, question here for you, Albert. Have you looked at high rates of S to keep up plant health? I spoke with a farmer agronomist in Michigan who found good results at 50 plus pounds of S, well above recommended levels of S. Uh, also an agronomist with Nutrien mentioned in a webinar that there needs to be more study on this. Any work on this, Albert? Well, again, it comes down to the whole idea of, you know, in I think you're talking sulfur or other micros and, and things like that as, as well. So it, it all comes back down to the whole idea 
a stress plant is more susceptible to a number of different factors and diseases in particular. I have not looked at that. You know, we're in the early stages. Our colleagues in the U.S., we haven't really looked at adding um, any of those other components in there. But again, the, you know, as Mike mentioned earlier too, you know, you, you always want to have a, a healthier plant is a, is a better plant from a dis defensive standpoint as, as well. Um, but again, key here is this disease can develop so rapidly from what you know we've seen and what Mike was showing and, and Rob and that 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 window towards that end of August early September can shut down those plants really quickly and 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 that and that has an impact on silage as well Mike you, you mentioned binoculars from the roadside to uh, do some scouting. Uh, there's a couple questions in the Q&A here about drones. Are, are you using drones at all to do any crop scouting and getting images? Like Rob showed some really good videos there, but uh, what are you using, Mike? No, I haven't uh, I haven't been using drones. Um, I've thought about getting them, but I just find that uh, being in the field is, is pretty much the number one way to be scouting I'm in the field looking for cutworm anyways. I think the uh, first few years we had cutworm was real bad. Uh, the last few years, it, it's been less severe. So we're taking a much uh, much closer look at fields uh, for cutworm anyways. So I'm in the field pretty much every field before I spray two, three days out of it. So Yeah, so Mike, I was just going to ask you, when I talk to farmers across the country, they always say, oh, I'm in my fields all the time. And, uh, you know, depending on what kind of crop you're growing, there's a different definition of what all the time is. Um, from a field scouting perspective, how do you try to manage the the acres and try to get into your fields as much as possible? You mentioned you like to be into the canopy, in the fields, getting, you know, seeing what's going on, not just from, you know, the, the 100K uh, drive by the field and, you know, sort of taking a bit of a glance at a high speed. How, how do you manage that from a crop scouting perspective? How often are you in there? Uh... For most of our fields, every few days, but it's it's become more difficult, no doubt, since uh, we bought a self-propelled sprayer and started a custom spraying. Uh, I guess that was two or three years ago now, so it is more difficult. Um, we do work with a couple of local retailers there in the field too, uh, kind of keeping track of things. Um, one thing I will mention to try and extend the spray window, we're actually planting some short day hybrids first. Uh, maybe about 20, 25 percent of our acres go in. Um, our, our area typically is that 98 to 110 day hybrids. Um, we're planting, yeah, about that 20 to 25 percent uh, of our acres are going in early, as, as early as we can, um, to try and spread out the application window. The other thing that does is if you have a hybrid that's really early tasseling, that's, you know, five days ahead of uh, most others, we've found that that will reduce the amount of cutworm pressure that you have. So you may be able to get away uh, from spraying, you know, say 500 or 1,000 acres uh, at 15 bucks an acre, that can add up, right? So uh, that's one way we're trying to spread out the application window and reduce uh, reduce pressure. Rob, there, there's a question here uh, alluding to something you said earlier regarding a carumba, full rate or half rate of carumba? Yep, so when we're topping up Altima, at this point, we're going to be recommending that, that full rate of Caramba for Gibrella. We're, we're still looking at other combinations for that to reduce the Gibrella or Don. Okay, because there, there's another question here. What rate of Caramba would you add to sharpen a jib control? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, Albert, is there a listing of varieties that are less susceptible to tar spot, and where is that posted? Wow, right now that is the big question. Um, there is not one um, in that, but you, you know, right off the bat, talk to your seed dealer for sure. In terms of um, that, you know, we are seeing some, as I mentioned, a few companies have started to put out their their hybrid ratings. Now, remember, this has been a work in progress. It's only been a few years, um, so those those ratings could could change uh, and and that as well. We are in the process right now, Dave Hooker and I looked at all of our 
Um, the Ontario performance trials, again, similar pattern there. There's a few that have maybe uh, some more tolerance there, um, but uh, overall more susceptibility. Again, it's a one year. Remember, every year is different. Uh, the impact and the difference from year to year by location, by hybrid, by disease can, can have an impact on those ratings as well. So you wanna have as much data as possible in that. And, and again, as Mike had said, you know, got to be out in that field, be out in that field and, uh, and, and know what's going on to be on top of things. Okay, and but Albert, is, this year, is every next company year well. doing the methodology of the rating the same? Because how do you compare and contrast, like you can talk to your seed dealer, but how do you compare across genetics types? Wow. So every, every company's, you know, you can see that from rating. Some will go from one to 10 as being 10 being the best. The other one, others will go the opposite, right? So um, as I said, the companies in terms of the ratings and the methodology is pretty similar um, in terms of what, what they're doing. And, and that uh, the fact will become the amount of time they've been able to evaluate those hybrids under those different environmental conditions to see the response between the environment and, and those genetics right now. So as of right now, there are some companies putting out their list there, it is available, but remember, you'll notice that in some cases, there'll be some exclamation marks there saying there's, this is an indication, but things can change as well. So we're not there yet on the hybrid side. We're, we have the same question when we talk about Dawn hybrids too, right? It, it takes a yeah. bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rob, I, I can't believe it's taken this long to get to this question. Uh, is there going to be any supply issues around Veltima? Wow. Yeah, I'm surprised too that it took this long. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, we are very, uh, there's, there's a lot of high demand for this product. Um, so definitely talk to your retailer, talk to your BSF rep. Uh, we we put a lot to the, to the channel and sold a lot through distribution. So there's going to be a lot in the channel, uh, but just definitely make sure you talk to your retail just to make sure it's in the, the right, um, the ideal location, um, just because we don't want it, you know, if tar spot does have an outbreak, you want to make sure that you have it in your shed or in that, that particular region. So we are fairly aggressive with forecasting and uh, yeah, there's also been a high demand for this product in, in both the US and in Canada as well, since they're dealing with a, a major outbreak as well. Yeah. Mike, from your perspective, how have you kind of steered and tried to manage through, you know, the there's a lot of stuff floating around in terms of shortages and all that kind of stuff on a number of products. Um, obviously, uh, supply of fertilizer, also another one. But uh, how have you managed that? Are you try to just get as much on farm as possible early as you can? Yeah, actually, um, I think it was a bit of stroke of luck on the chem side. Uh, I had a fair bit of fall spraying planned and just because we had so much rain, um, we basically got zero sprayed. So thankfully there is some hem in the shed at last year's prices, but uh, it's a concern, no doubt. But uh, we also utilize uh, nitrogen storage. So we've got uh, pretty much all our needs sitting on the farm already. So the big, the big ones uh, we've got taken care of, thankfully. Yeah, you, you just mentioned the price, last year's price. I, 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 you know, Peter W.P. Johnson and I were talking about this on Monday's episode of Real Ag Radio, where you know, there's so much focus on the price. I, I, I think sometimes people have sort of forgotten about the supply side. And no matter what the price, just getting it on farm, um, it just is really, really, I think, the message uh, to hit home for, for this year of 2022. Uh, oh, now my question thing disappeared. Just give me a second here. Okay, uh, another question here. Albert, have you seen different field results with tar spot regarding aerial or ground application? Yeah, so that's that's another good question. No, so prior, we were hoping to the past two years to continue our spray rodeo where we did different um, nozzle configurations, um, over the top drop nozzles, and that as well as helicopter versus uh, um, air, airplanes as well and hoping for drones as, as well. Um, our results in terms of coverage, um, and we will do that again this year, we saw no difference in terms of um, 
the deposition on the ear leaf itself or on the on the canopy and on on the leaves itself so from that application it's the timing side is probably more important your product selection is probably more important the application method is if you're not doing it right it's it's going to be an issue but from both the aerial and ground um you know we're quite confident in in getting getting it where it needs to be and let the the product do do its thing there as well. There's been some work um, in the U.S. Um, um, Damon Smith um, in, in Wisconsin had did some this past year looking at efficacy. And again, it, it became uh, the application method wasn't as critical as your product selection. And that timing is very important. Yeah. Rob, you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it all comes down to timing and the product and the person behind the wheel. So I, I will say when it comes to aerial application if you are considering doing some application make sure you book those acres now um, i've talked to a lot of aerial applicators in the last month or so and and they're still kind of balancing their workload and you know where to put all the different uh, airplanes and, and helicopters so uh, don't go to them the last minute or say okay you know we're in the area can you spray this field and this field it's always easier to take fields off the list and be organized just in case we do end up with a, uh, a big tar spot year and we don't want to be more revenge spraying as well. We, they're going to book up fairly quickly so definitely talk to uh, talk to your retailer and talk to them uh, uh, well in advance. Minimize the revenge spraying. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I like that. This is, uh, yeah, once again the message is this is not a just-in-time kind of year. This is a year yeah. where we need to do some forecasting, plan ahead the best we can. There's going to be some variables thrown our way from a weather perspective. It's easier to, like you said, pull stuff off the list and then try to add it uh, later on. Hey, Mike, uh, you went through a really good list in terms of planning ahead for 2022. What are the three things you try to do to manage most for you know producing that high, cool. high yielding corn? Well, I think it starts right from your fertility plan. Uh, we variable rate most of our uh, fertilizer through an air cart through the planter. I think the banding, uh, especially when you have these crazy uh, fertilizer prices, I think your your best bang for your buck is going to be two by two, um, by two by two. But uh, yeah, I think that's the foundation for everything that we're starting with. Uh, having up to date soil samples is important as well to know where you're at. Uh, maybe it's a year where you you know, instead of building or maintaining, you might be using that uh, drawdown method to try and get the most value out of those products. So I think that's the first thing. Um, the second is securing those products. I think you need to try and get hold of them as soon as possible. Um, that's just my opinion, but we've been using nitrogen storage for a long time. Um, and it seems to have a pretty good return on investment every single year. There's the odd year where you don't see it, but uh, having the products ready, staged, and just load them on the, either the planter or the sprayer, and, and you're going, I think that's really important. Um, yeah, I guess that's two of the biggest things. But Okay, awesome stuff. Appreciate it. Uh, Rob, what impact does tar spot have on silage corn, and do we see a benefit to spraying fungicides in that situation? Yeah, so I think uh, there's just like with green corn, there's some silage hybrids that are very susceptible to to various leaf diseases. Not only tar spot, but uh, but also northern corn leaf blight, uh, tar spot, or um, eye spot as well. So uh, we we generally do see a response, um, especially in terms of that standability. So you you notice some of the, the pictures that we saw, like in that September 10th to 16th time frame, that's when it really started to see major differences in, in dry down and lodging. And that's probably the biggest risk with silage corn. And the biggest benefit to that fungicide application is keeping that plant greener longer and reducing that lodging potential. So we didn't do uh, any work, or I guess we did some work on silage this year. Unfortunately, we didn't have tar spots show up in, in any of the trials because they were kind of in the, uh, the Woodstock area. But, uh, but in the US, they've seen that, and it really comes down to that standability. The thing is, when you spray silage corn with a fungicide, it is going to be wetter at harvest. So it's going to be four, maybe five percentage points higher in moisture, maybe a little bit higher if tar spot's present. Um, but that can actually work in your favor and spread out your workload a little bit because it doesn't, it's not drying down too fast. But we just want to make sure that you, you can monitor that um, and you're aware of that so that you can prioritize harvest. 
Hey, Rob, what, what about uh, despo- deposition control agents or water conditioners? Yeah, so we we haven't, uh, you know, we've looked at some. Um, we haven't done widespread. I know it's a, a common use pattern in, in the States. Um, it really comes down to the, the environmental conditions at, at, uh, at application. So if it's a windy conditions or if you're driving too fast through the field or you're, you know, the nozzle configuration, sometimes I think people think, okay, well, it's windy, I'm going to add a drift reduction agent. Sometimes you might have to question, you know, should I be out there, there spraying um, in those conditions? So um, we haven't really seen a, a big benefit, yay or nay. Um, you know, they are compatible. Make sure you do a jar test just to, uh, just to be sure. So, and Mike, I'm not sure if you have uh, experience with some of added various additives as well in your custom spray business or interested in your thoughts for that uh not in fungicide so much uh we do the odd uh application of the srn with fungicide we've done that on a few acres but uh mm-hmm. overall it's it's mainly the fungicide and uh, the insecticide if you need it so that's essentially the gist of it for us great albert another question for you should growers be concerned about fungicide efficacy or resistance since we currently only have three major modes of action for fighting leaf or ear diseases yeah so of course you know we see that in soybeans right now with frog eye leaf spot and and resistance to a, a number of the groups there particularly the strobulurins and and that as well and so yeah of course and and you you starting to notice that the products out there and the efficacy are we're definitely for tar spot we're seeing those products that have two and three way modes of action being more efficacious having better control for for tar spot that also helps us in terms of our disease um, or resistance or fungicide resistance side of things um, with with tar spot we're not sure where it falls into say the potential risk from a resistance standpoint as some of the other pathogens, but for sure, um, as we spray more acres, there is that potential risk for for resistance. Part of that, I guess, is built into the the, the multiple modes of action to reduce that as well. So, but critically important is when you apply any product out there, you always should be out there evaluating as well. So if you don't see that control that you were expecting, you know, call call your retailer call us call somebody just to figure out what's going on is it was it a misapplication was there a mix up or something or is there a an issue of resistance there and so if you don't see the results you expect find out why great stuff and albert most important question of the day when do you think opening day is gonna be for baseball with this strike going on Oh, I don't know. I'm dying to get out there. I would love to go for my spring training. That's not happening either, but uh, let's hope for April 5th. Oh, uh, seems in doubt, Albert. Seems in doubt. I know. This has been fantastic. I really do appreciate everybody uh, joining us here today. We're we're out of time. Uh, Great questions from the audience. Really, really do appreciate it. Our, Our goal is to provide you with information that helps you move your operation forward we'd like to hear what you thought of today's webinar and would appreciate if you could take a minute to answer the brief survey question you'll see when you exit the webinar and once again for those of you who are certified crop advisors and or certified crop science consultants you're eligible eligible to receive one cu credit for attending this webinar if you registered at an earlier date and forgot to provide your numbers something i would do please contact egg solutions customer care Shortly after this webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. We'll also post our questions and answers from the session today with the link provided. Keep your eyes on your inbox for that communication. For any additional questions that weren't answered today, talk to your trusted BSF Ag Solutions representative or call the Ag Solutions customer care line at 877-371-2273 to learn more. Thank you again for attending. We wish you all the best in the coming season. And it's going to be here before you know it. Thanks a lot for joining us here today, everybody. Cheers.